Hello, and welcome to the Eastern Front. My name is Yulia Zorja. I'm with the Middle East Institute, Georgetown and George Washington Universities, and I'm joined by... Giselle Donnelly. I'm a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, and... Dalibur Rojas, also with AI. On our podcast, we talk about the many challenges to European peace that tend to emerge along a line running from the Baltic to the Black Sea, the Eastern Front, and about why those matter to the United States. If you enjoy this episode, as always, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. Today, we have with us Jeff Gedman, who you might have heard before at, in the very first few months as uh, a guest on the podcast when we were Dalibor, me and him on the Eastern Front in Ukraine. But today he's joining us as acting president and CEO of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And he's also joined by first time guest. We have a series of people from Radio Free Europe because we love you guys and the work that you're doing. But for the first time, we have Pavel Butorin, who is director of Current Time at Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. And Jeff and Pavel are here to talk about journalists detained and first and foremost, Alsu, who's been all over Western media over the last two weeks. She's a journalist with Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. She is a U.S. citizen, a dual citizen, Russian and U.S., and she is what we think is wrongfully detained in Russia. So, Jeff and Pavel, thank you so much for joining us today. If you want to get us started on Alsu, where she is, why she's important, and what you guys are doing to help her, And then we'll broaden the conversation to also ask about other journalists in trouble that are working with and for Radio for Europe. So welcome. Julia, thank you very much. And Dalibor and Giselle, great to be with you. And it's always great to be with my colleague, Pavel. Pavel, if it's okay with you, I'm going to take the liberty of starting us off. And, and thank you so much. This is a subject that is so important to this company, R-F-E-R-L. The basic facts of the case go like this. We have a treasured colleague whom you mentioned also, who reports on things like culture and language and minority rights, who this summer on May 20th took a private trip to Russia, to Kazan, to visit her mother, elderly and frail. And when also tried to leave the country, come back to Prague, where she lives and works, on June 2nd, she was detained and both her passports were confiscated. So, Julia, you're right. She is, as I would put it, a Russian by birth and an American by choice. And suddenly she was unable to travel. Uh, so went July and August and September. And then suddenly on October 18th, things turned and she was arrested. She was brought in for interrogation. Her photo page for American passport was published. Her husband was denounced. And now she sits in pre-trial detention in Kazan. And we're worried about her. Charges present and perhaps maybe charges to come. And I'm here with our distinguished leader of current time, Russian language television, digital network, but also Alsu's husband and the father of their two children. Pavel, I laid out as clinically as I could the basic facts of the case, and I'd like to turn it over to you. They will have questions, Dalbert, Sal, and Yulia. But what have I left out that's important for this audience to know and understand? Uh, Jeff, thank you. And thank you all for having me. I am indeed Pavel Batorin, the head of Karen Time, but I'm speaking with you today primarily as Elsu's husband and as the father of our children. Elsu has been away from us for almost six months now. At first, she was able to communicate with her family. She was allowed to be in her mother's apartment, but we had a way to communicate with her. And this case, her first case, where she was accused of not reporting her American citizenship to the Russian government, which is now a crime, dragged on for about five months. And eventually, a judge issued a, a fine, a relatively small fine, and we were waiting for her to pay the fine. But before she was able to pay uh, that relatively small fine, masked men identifying as uh, police or investigative committee came knocking on her door and took her away. Uh, and that happened on October 18th, and she has been in detention since. Alsu is in a cell, which, you know, as we know, 
It's quite cold. It's about zero Celsius in, in Kazan, Tatarstan right now. There, there are ways to communicate with her through an official online system uh, that takes only Russian-issued payment cards. So not everyone here is able to communicate with her. We know that some of those messages are censored. So because also cannot openly communicate with us, we cannot be sure that her captors are treating her with the dignity and respect that she deserves. So that certainly gives me you know, cause for concern about her conditions. And I will say again that Alsu traveled to Russia in her personal capacity. She is a proud Tatar, proud journalist with Radio Free Europe. However, on this particular trip, she was not doing any reporting. She was attending to a family circumstance. She had to travel there to help out her sick mom. And what I find troubling is that I think that the Russian authorities were waiting for an American citizen to find themselves in this situation, in this vulnerable uh, position to be in Russia on family circumstances. And as if they'd been waiting for that to happen and to uh, arrest someone on these absurd charges of not self-reporting themselves as so-called foreign agents. Pavel, I, I, I know this has just got to be an incredibly tender subject for you, but it's impossible not to empathize with your situation and Alsu's situation. I guess the thing that immediately leaps to mind is what do you know about her condition? And when she left to see her mother, did she anticipate the risk at this scale or the, a danger that would be this frightening, just to put a word on it? You know, what were you guys talking about as she prepared to go see her mother? Alsu was aware of the risks associated with this trip. And that was something that we discussed in the family, something that she discussed here with her colleagues at RFE. She is a devoted daughter. She, again, was aware of possible consequences, but perhaps not of this scale. This is the first case uh, when someone has been detained on charges of not self-reporting themselves as a foreign agent. It's really unprecedented. Russia does have a list of organizations and individuals uh, that it believes to be foreign agents. Uh, many of our colleagues here at Radio Free Europe are on that list. However, Alsu was not on it. She was not on that list. Uh, the Russian government had not listed her as a so-called foreign agent. So I'm pretty sure that it was quite a shock to her to even find out that she she was expected to report upon herself. She doesn't consider herself to be a foreign agent. We don't <laughs> think there's an agent. Yeah. She's not an agent. She's not acting on behalf of the United States government or of any government, for that matter. She's a journalist. So, yes, we're aware of the risks, perhaps not of this magnitude. But again, she's a, a devoted daughter, and she had to attend to a family emergency. So I'm going to add very briefly, if I may, across the company, this creates now uh, very big dilemmas, because whether it's Afghanistan for its reasons, Iran, Russia, Belarus, uh, whatever was the case one, two, three years ago, and these were not entirely free and liberal and pluralistic societies with kind regimes in the first place, these countries and markets are tightening and tightening and tightening month by month and quarter by quarter. And so I think for many of our editors and producers and technicians and journalists, they have to weigh, we urge them to refrain from travel to these increasingly dangerous places and they weigh responsibility to the company, care for their own safety and security and obligations and the bonds of family. It's hard now. Yeah, I, I'm entirely sympathetic. You know, Jeff is a former reporter who's independently, you know, gone to war zones and things like that. I'm familiar with the judgments that one has to make. Things that I did 25 and 30 years ago, I certainly wouldn't do now. And nothing is analogous to the kind of situation one would find in Russia today. So it's just striking a very personal chord. Dalibor, you were, yeah. If, if I may, so so I, I presume that Auschwitz is getting you know, legal assistance, that, that she is talking to lawyers who might be able to, to help her. But the problem, of course, is that the idea that there is due process and any sort of you know, rule of law that she could rely on in Russia is, is obviously illusory. And, and whatever charges they are brought against her, whatever process or trial she'll be put through, 
is just the facade for essentially power play. I mean, the Russian regime is doing this because it can, uh, just as they are doing it to Evan Gershkovich and any number of, of other people. And so, so if there is hope, I presume it is, you know, in the realm of politics. It is in the realm of U.S. government flexing its muscles or perhaps offering concessions to the Kremlin that would be valuable enough for for the Russians to to release her and others who have suffered from a from a similar fate. Um, obviously, this is extremely sensitive, and I don't want to put you in a sort of awkward situation. But what what is the State Department doing on this front? Do you have a sense of you know what the administration is thinking? The best course of action is in situations like these, particularly within Russia. And then if I can add one more thing, and then perhaps we'll we'll cast the net a little bit wider after this. I've also been wondering to what extent Alsu is maybe even a little bit more vulnerable than Evan because she has dual citizenship. And so that makes her perhaps even a double target in terms of being a U.S. citizen, and Pavel has alluded to that, but also being a Russian citizen and what journalists now mean in Russia. So, so I'm going to go first, if I may, Dalibor and Yulia. So first of all, true Yulia and Evan and Asu are both Americans, and they're the two American journalists held now in detention unjustly and unlawfully. Pavel can say more about that. Second of all, uh, to you, Dalibor, I was in Washington two weeks ago, and I will be in Washington in 12 days from now with Pavel, where we will continue to meet with the White House and with the State Department and our close allies on Capitol Hill. The United States government has been open and constructive and supportive, and with two hot wars, and dare I say, a bit of political dysfunction in the nation's capital, it's a tough time. And we're working it, and we're going to get traction. We do have legal support on the ground. Pavel can say more about that. We are retaining a U.S. firm called Pro Bono, and we're investigating, as we speak, let's say, more effective counsel inside Russia. But you're right. At the end of the day, this is a politically motivated case, which almost certainly will have a political solution. But Pavel, please over to you. So about representation, also is working with two local lawyers right now, and they're doing their job you know, to the best of their ability, and they're working within the Russian system. However, we must recognize that Alsu cannot fully rely on the Russian courts, uh, Russian system for justice. The judiciary is hardly independent in Russia. And this is why we're working very hard to mount as much pressure as possible on Russia to raise as much awareness uh, as possible about Alsu's case. This is why I think that it, it's to Alsu's benefit that we are liaising with the State Department and trying hoping for the United States to address this on the highest diplomatic level and about her dual citizenship. So Russia and the United States do not have an agreement of du- on dual citizenship. For Russia, she is a Russian uh, citizen. For the United States, she is an American citizen. To me, also, is not a dual national. She is an American citizen, first and foremost. She has the same rights as any other U.S. citizen, born American or naturalized. And I do hope that she's treated as such a citizen by the United States government. And I hope that her rights as an American citizen are upheld. To date, she has not been granted consular access. And as far as I understand, today, which marks four weeks in detention, well, soon, I don't think the Russian government has informed officially the United States of her detention. Hmm. I just want to add briefly, as we work hard, hard, hard day and night to, to work toward her release, We are also working to see if we can get better conditions. She's not been convicted of anything, you know. She's in pretrial detention. And it's just simply profoundly disappointing to see an American citizen in conditions of overcrowded cell, limited sunlight. It's hard to sleep with lights on. As Pavel said, if it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit without good blankets, it's hard to, to sustain your mental health uh, for most of us day after day and week after week. So we are appealing to Russian authorities, whatever they are seeking in such a case, a little bit of decency and a little bit of humanity. Just uh, ask a little bit about 
what also may have been telling you, Pavel and Jeff, in the period prior to her, uh, I don't think it's unfair to call it abduction, uh, uh, particularly in Kazan, you know, a mixed ethnic city and the relations between ethnic Russians and Tatars has not always been a, a happy one. I mean, the whole thing sounds like something out of late Cold War, you know, spy literature or espionage literature. Did also express any anxiety about being reported by her neighbor? I mean, you know, this, again, this is very cliched interpretation, but we have so few insights into what life is like inside Russia these days. So uh, I'd just be interested to know if there are any indicators or anxieties she may have felt prior to the actual intervention of the authorities, or was it just an out-of-the-blue event? And maybe one small semi-related thing to add here for our audience's context is that we've had Alsu's editor at Radio Free Europe somewhat recently on our podcast here, Rim Gilfanov, talking about Tatars in Russia, in the Black Sea region, and specifically in um, in Ukraine as well. Alsu is self-identifying as Tatar and has been working with um, Rim Gilfanov for, what, 25 years? 25 years. Correct. If I, if I may, um, what was strikes me about uh, just to maybe widen the the, the aperture a little bit, what what strikes me about the this situation and the sort of broader environment that illustr- illustrates is is just the sort of sheer arbitrary nature of the Russian state, which objectively has created tighter conditions for journalists, particularly foreign journalists, than the former Soviet Union. Yet at the same time, in this sort of strange, almost surreal postmodern world, somebody like Steve Rose. Rosenberg is allowed to air his, you know, what strike me as as very candid dispatches from from Russia, whereas others get arrested on on a basis that doesn't seem to follow a clear logic. Obviously, uh, you don't operate in Russia for precisely those those reasons. Yet you have to rely on help from Russian sources and Russian stringers, Russian contributors who are putting themselves at risk to do this work. How are you thinking about, you know, gaining perhaps a technological edge over the Russian state in enabling a more or less free flow of information to continue in a way that would continue to sort of enlighten our own understanding of, of Russia and what's going on? Because I think that is specifically what is what is at stake here, If especially if, if the environment continues to tighten further. All right, so several points have been made. And uh, let me just pick up on something that was said about also his Tatar identity. Let me talk to that first. I can't think of a more passionate enthusiast of Tatar culture and language. Alsu dedicated her entire career. No, scratch that. Not just her career, her life. This is something that she does in her free time <laughs> to advancing her language and her culture. And, and so it's particularly disheartening for me to see her native Tatarstan holding her behind bars, possibly on Moscow's orders, someone who's been so passionate about the Tatar language and culture. And so they're holding her in a cold prison cell on these ridiculous charges. And I would expect a lot more appreciation, as a matter of fact, from, from her native Tatarstan, to which she dedicated her whole life. So yeah, I'll say that about her identity. And this is really what, what makes you makes her stand out. It defines her, really. Did that make her more of a target, do you think? Like, look at all the names, that, uh, all the judges, and, and, you know, as far as we know, uh, I mean, they sound Tatar. I, I don't want to make it, you know, an ethnic thing necessarily, you know, but, but Tatarstan is, yes, Kazan is multi-ethnic, but it's, you know, you got to, you know, you travel a little bit outside of Kazan, it's, it, it's very Tatar. She, as a matter of fact, while we're talking uh, about also his time there since uh, mid-May, uh, late May, uh, the first two weeks, she spent some of those two weeks, uh, some of that time with her mother. They traveled to the village where her late uh, grandmother used to live. And, you know, she was really immersed in this in this Tatar culture for at least two weeks. I mean, don't people have the right to do that? You know, we believe in freedom of movement and, you know, you want to be close to roots. And it did come out of the blue. It, it was a surprise that she was about to board an airplane on her way back home to me and our children. 
when her name was called up on, on the loudspeaker at that airport. You, you know, so we slice and dice and we wonder, we try to read the mind of the dictators. And, and so I defer to Pavel on whether culture, language, ethnicity had something to do with this. But, or and, it's bewildering and sobering to realize that someone, a woman like Asu, who was in effect a culture, language, and minority rights reporter, that those things are deemed in some places like Vladimir Putin's Russia as crimes. And, you know, our friend Susie Garment wrote recently about Asu and American purpose. And Susie's formulation was, it's just journalism. But in this day and age, it creates, as she put it, real paranoia in the minds of the men who have the guns. It's striking and sobering. It, it certainly fits in such a long chain of Putin's targets um, that have been for a long time now focusing exactly on journalists. And um, so both of you, Jeff and Pavel, are operating in or with Russian-speaking media. And you've been seeing this very closely. Can you tell us a little bit more about how being a journalist has changed, particularly since the full-scale invasion in this Russian-speaking world in Eastern Europe and beyond? And then also about other Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty journalists on in the Russian-speaking space that are detained. And if I may just sort of re-up my question on how, what, what sort of measures you take to protect people who are inside of Russia and are helping your reporting? Because it strikes me that it's, it's, it's almost an arms race that is going on, particularly as these people sort of go sort of underground and, and do their reporting in a sort of discreet manner without you know, being exposed to, to the authorities. I think a lot of thought has to go into you know how to keep them safe. Uh, Talibor, I think it's fair to say that for a company like this, a great deal of time is has been spent and is being spent on how to do the work that we're obliged to do, U.S. taxpayer funded, while keeping our people safe. And by the way, it's the journalists, but I, I can tell you all aspects of this company, I think if you're in procurement or HR or finance or any number of other departments, if you're part of a congressionally funded RFERL and you travel to certain areas, including now Central Asia, you know, in October, there was a Russian blogger dissident in Bishkek in Kyrgyzstan, 23 years old, let's say minding his own business, so to speak. And one late night in October, two vehicles, 10 masked men, he's disappeared and turns up last week in Moscow in a pre-trial detention center. So it's a large problem. I think it's a trend. I'm going to say something to what Julia asked about and then turn the microphone back to Pavel. Um, we do have concerns about markets like Iran and Afghanistan and Central Asia. We have, as we speak, colleagues in prison in Belarus. We have one in Russian-occupied Crimea. They're all journalists. I would even say, to underscore the, the intensity of the matter, Dalabor, we have a spouse in prison in Belarus because she had the audacity to say, let my husband go. That gets you a jail sentence. Pavel, why don't you speak to any aspect of that? Journalists are an endangered species in Russia. You are either pro-government and uh, essentially doing PR work for, for the government, or you risk persecution, prosecution, imprisonment, or something that the government may deem you know, what they call discrediting the Russian armed forces, even reporting about voices that oppose uh, Russia's war on Ukraine is dangerous. As, as we know all too well. Our journalists here uh, in Prague who come from Russia and who work for so many departments here at RTRL, they don't feel safe going back to Russia. Uh, many of them have similar family situations where their elderly ailing parents are not able to travel outside of Russia. Some of them have to go to family reunions to you know, third countries, but even those countries are now unsafe. Uh, countries where Russians can travel still freely to a very few, very few countries, really. We are, we're so lucky to have some journalists inside Russia working with us. Some of them work you know, anonymously without a byline, but it's becoming increasingly dangerous. 
for them to continue working for any independent media outlet. As you know, many Russian journalists have left uh, Russia since the beginning of the full-scale invasion. They found uh, a new home in other countries. But the challenge for them, and perhaps for us, is to how remain relevant, uh, how to produce content that is relevant to audiences inside Russia. And, uh, and, and therefore, we're finding new ways about reporting, about using uh, open source intelligence, you know, working with social media, verifying content, etc. So this is a very challenging time, but I do believe that we will continue successfully to cover all things inside Russia as well as outside. Jeff, I wonder if you could speak to the situation in other you know, authoritarian European countries. You mentioned Belarus, which is you know, only a step behind the Russians in terms of their ability to persecute journalists, but also you have to wonder what the situation is in Hungary or uh, now in Slovakia or Serbia, for example, whether you're able to conduct business as usual or have to make adjustments to protect r reporters in those countries. So just how good heavens, <laughs> the day has come. We were asking about freedom of media in places like Belarus and Hungary. But I just want to know how bad. It's worth drawing attention to, is it not? Uh, of course, of course it is. And so, you, you know, there's just such severity in a place like Belarus, whereby most count of independent human rights groups, uh, there are more than 1,500 political prisoners. That's mind focusing. And in a case of Belarus, I can tell you, as we work to get our people free, the influence of the United States and the European Union, it's oh so slight. I mean, how do we get to that point? The channels the access points, the, the ability to pry someone out, it's so, so slight. But we have big challenges in Iran. We do all platforms, by the way. We do 27 languages, by the way. I attended today a program review of our um, Persian service, far to all platforms, by the way. And Iran, where we're not permitted a bureau, no surprise, where we do have a network of stringers around Iran in places like Baku, Istanbul, Dubai, Yerevan, where Iranians come and go more or less, where we can collect information and do decent reporting. That market is tightening and tightening and tighter than a drum. It becomes increasingly dangerous. Then I want to say a word about Hungary, which is, and Dalibor, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, because you've written so extensively about Hungary. It's not Belarus or Iran, for God's sake. I mean, a lot of hate mail from the Hungarian embassy in Prague and Washington after this podcast. But, but it's become a kind of low-functioning democracy where power is centralized where the market economy has become distorted or corrupt or serving, self-serving elites. And the media space for genuine, independent, free, competitive media is shrinking and shrinking. I was in Budapest three weeks ago because lo and behold, RFERL, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, how many years, three decades after the Cold War, we reopened operations in Hungary, and I think we're performing actually a public service. The Orban government will not talk to us at all, ever, about anything. That's regrettable, but maybe a badge of honor. And, and the opposition, I have to tell you, I met, I had an hour privately with the mayor of Budapest, who's an opposition figure, and he said, good for you, what you're doing, how you're doing it, critical and independent. And then he smiled and he said, well, actually, you don't make my life easy all the time anyway, but I guess it comes with the territory. So it's part of a larger trend from the, if I may, the, the moderate, soft, centralizing power power of Hungary to the severity of Belarus, but it's part of a larger picture. In this part of your parts, plural of Europe, I think it's very troubling. Generally, the, the control of media is so critical to modern authoritarianism. I think there is a spectrum, right, of what these different regimes can do. Obviously, in Hungary or Slovakia, people are not getting locked up for reporting on the government or running, you know, investigative stories. Although, you know, a Slovak journalist was killed by, by a mobster back in 20, 2018 together with his fiance. But the Hungarian model revolves around just making it economically impossible for independent media outlets to exist. So, so if you have a newspaper, radio station, TV station, 
you have been already driven out of business if you try if you had the big reach and and, and try to do in, in independent reporting and and there is this I mean, residual sort of environment of very tiny media outlets operating online, which makes Hungary look, you know, increasingly like Russia in that respect, which also has a sort of, you know, small ecosystem of of nominally independent outlets with very little relevance to the overall public conversation. So, so that's the dynamic in Slovakia, you know, not much has happened since the election. Already, newspapers, outlets critical of the government have been excluded from participating in press conferences by government officials, you know, being labeled as enemies of the people and, and, and so on and so forth. So I'm just saying that this puts the mission of RFERFL into sharper relief, makes it, I don't want to say more important than ever, but more important than ever. It's a message uh, to, for the U.S. Congress. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, to the degree that this is a struggle of information and ideas. Yes, a message to all of us that this matters a lot. I, I do think that this, uh, and I'm hoping for our audience too, that this focuses the mind primarily, of course, on Alsu and her case, um, but secondarily also on the struggle of journalism in Central and Eastern Europe, all the way from soft Hungary, as Dadebor put it, um, uh, into what is probably now the roughest regime for journalists in all the way in Russia and in Belarus. Before we go, because that is a good note on which to end and as food for thought, just a very quick question to both of you, Jeff and Pavel, about the names of the other journalists along with Alsu um, that are detained and about how we and our audience can help Alsu too, including the hashtag free Alsu on Twitter or X. So Julia, we're, we're going to send you all the names and I'm going to check before I do so with our security department about what's public and what's not public and how we want to formulate it. And thank you because we want that support. And then before I get from our side, the final word to Pavel, and thank you for the way you framed it. We are fighting for the freedom of a woman and mother and colleague named Alsu. I firmly believe that there's a wider meaning to her story. And it's about decency and integrity and humanity, the importance and value of freedom of speech and expression and independent thought. I strongly believe that when we fight for her, we're fighting for a larger purpose in which we all believe. So thank you for mentioning that. And uh, thank you for having us. Pavel, I'm going to pass it over to you for our side for final thoughts. I was asked in a recent interview about also what I do every day, how I begin my day. And I, I do begin my day with checking everything also related messages from my colleagues, friends, social media, and I have a couple of paintings at home that feature Elsu that I've done over the years. And I have this one painting where Elsu is just looking at you, just this piercing look, as if asking me, are you doing enough to help me out of here? And I want to do more. And I want to use this opportunity, this podcast, all other interviews and the press engagements to raise awareness, to spread the word. I will appreciate uh, if you also uh, do that. And she needs our support. She does receive a lot of letters from complete strangers. We want her to know that this is a worldwide 24-7 campaign for her release. And I want this campaign to continue. This is not just a single news story for us. This is our life and it affects our family. It affects this organization. It affects so many journalists around the world. And so I thank you for your support and uh, let's keep it up. We'll be also grateful if you spread the word about us and, and this cause. That's what we're doing on this podcast. Thank you so much, Pavel Buterin and Jeffrey Gedman of Radio for Europe for joining us today from me, Yulia Zhoja, and my friends, Giselle Donnelly and Dalek Burohaj. Thank you for listening to the Eastern Front. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing us. To stay up to date with the Eastern Front, please give us a follow on Twitter or X at Eastern Front Pod, one word, and sign up for a newsletter through the link included in the show notes. You can find more episodes and additional content on our website, aei.org, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you, and until next time, goodbye.